Hello, I'm David Menton. I'm a biologist here at the Creation Museum. I have a background more in human anatomy and histology, but uh, I'm going to talk about uh, birds today, and you really can't talk about birds without uh, talking about dinosaurs, it seems, these days. Uh, we call it farm to fly, and one of the things we're going to address, I think, very firmly is uh, are birds really dinosaurs? In April of 2020, medical doctor David Menton gave a lecture in a church wherein he tried to counter the scientific consensus that birds are a surviving subset of dinosaurs. Just as mallards are a subset of ducks and ducks are a subset of birds, birds are the only surviving group of dinosaurs in the same way that lions are cats and iguanas are lizards and terriers are dogs. It's impossible to separate terriers from dogs because terriers are dogs, even if they're very different from some other types of dogs. If the Bible said that terriers were not dogs, then Dr. Menton might show you a German Shepherd, a Basset Hound, or a Great Pyrenees compared to a Boston Terrier or a Shih Tzu to show how different they are, while also lying about those differences. But they cannot extract terriers out of the parent category of dogs. In the same way, Menton tried to divide birds from their parent category of dinosaurs by whatever deceptive differences he could misrepresent. He has to do that because he's only pretending to do science, because he's employed as a shill for a very lucrative pseudoscience propaganda mill, with a policy requiring that they will automatically and thoughtlessly reject, without consideration, any and all evidence that will ever be discovered in every field of study that contradicts their narrow, dogmatically literal, verbatim reading of their favorite folklore. All staff scientists must also sign a declaration of faith, swearing to promote Christian fundamentalism, regardless what the facts are. They have to make believe whatever the sacred fables say, simply because it says so, even when it's obviously absolute nonsense and evidently not and cannot be true. This means that they can never honestly concede or correct any mistake, even when they know they're wrong. It is the most dishonest position it is possible to have. This video is the second in a series where I will be countering Dr. Menton's bogus claims with the help of professional paleontologist Darren Nash, who is especially familiar with the uh, various evolutionary transitions driving birds out of the base template of Manoraptor and dinosaurs. However, Dr. Nash will not be on this particular episode because he is a scientist and Menton is a religious extremist who doesn't care about advancing scientific understanding. He only cares about promoting his mystical beliefs. And this part of Menton's presentation isn't about science so much as it is his apologetics excuses in defense of his faith. Although, at this point in his presentation, he was still saying some very silly things about ostriches. Well, what's inside of that ostrich? How do the bones look? Let's bring them out where we can see them. And uh, there you can see, right in that circle, we have the unusual hip bones of the bird. This hip is called a synsacrum. That means a, a putting together of the parts of the sacrum, a combining of parts. And in that hip bone, which is essentially one bone, are approximately 20 to 22 separate fused bones. <laughs> These would include a vertebra as well as the ilium, ischium, and pubic bones. So uh, everything in the circle, or most of what's in the circle, is inside the body. And we're just seeing the leg from the knee on down. In fact, if you think about it, when you eat chicken meat, and you're going to understand chicken meat, now it'd be worth the whole show for that. Uh, the drumstick would be between the knee and the ankle. The skin goes all the way around it. But that piece of meat called the thigh, that's from up inside of the bird's body. And you'll notice the skin's on only one side of that piece of meat, the thigh, because that whole femur with its muscles inside the body. No dinosaur like this at all. You have no trouble finding dinosaur knees. I'll show you a few. Every theropod dinosaur has legs like this, from the toes to the ankle to the knee to the femur, connected to the pelvis all the way back here. Their legs are exactly birds' legs. When birds lost their long tails, they had to pull their visible knees up forward a bit just to keep their balance. That's it. It's just a slight change in position, but it's the exact same structure, unchanged. That's the only difference. And if you put a counterweight where the tail used to be, that difference instantly disappears as the bird is forced to walk like a Tyrannosaurus. 
But more important than the fact that yet another creation of pseudoscience propagandists deliberately misrepresented or distorted the truth of the matter, understand what Dr. Menton wants you to believe. That God designed the legs of birds to be exactly like those of dinosaurs. That he designed them deceptively to look as though they had evolved that way. Of course, Menton pretends that it doesn't look like that at all. A creator god wouldn't modify existing organisms to accommodate an awkward design that was intended for something else. He's not a repairman. He's a creator. Every organism that ever evolved fits into its place in the evolutionary tree of life, even the platypus. But created things always violate taxonomy. For example, here's a fantasy animal that looks much more like what uh, Menton describes for ostriches. Maybe this is what he thinks ostriches look like without feathers. If birds were specially created with this unique balance requirement, then God would have made them with their legs positioned in the middle of their bodies, not anchored all the way to the very back of a dinosaur's pelvis. An intelligent designer is not going to use an inefficient design that only works for something else. He would specifically design something new and different for whatever new thing he's making that has new requirements. Evolution, however, can only modify a template that is already there, and that's why birds' legs and pelvises look like so much like those of dinosaurs. Well, I called this lecture uh, some years ago, and I first put it together without the dinosaurs. I called it Farm to Fly, and I used that expression because an uh, ornithology lab guide that I had used in college many years ago, written by the great ornithologist Pettengill, he had pointed out that one recognizes birds because they're formed to fly. Everything about their body is optimized. Now, some birds fly in water, not in air. Check this bird out. He's only going to be up for a few uh, seconds. Notice every part of his body is in motion. The tail, the head, individual feathers are being adjusted. This is not a glider. This is a flyer. What you're looking at is a very highly refined dinosaur. Many dinosaurs bear some resemblance to birds. Even ceratopsians look a bit like birds. But there was one line of dinosaurs called theropods that go about on two very bird-like legs. Within theropoda, there are a number of dinosaurian subsets that are much more bird-like, though still definitely not birds, even though they had very well-tuned senses, skills, and reflexes for hunting and maneuvering that we now admire in modern raptors. Some of these dinosaurian lineages include a diverse group of almost birds, feathered dinosaurs, some of whom had small wings, even if they had no other adaptations for flight. One curious exception are a group of scansoriopterygids. These were tiny dinosaurs that had feathers and wings, but not feathered wings like a bird. These were not birds. These were a side branch that went another way. They had the most primitive type of tail feathers, but they never developed flight feathers like other dinosaurs did. Instead, their wings were on a skin membrane like that of a bat or a pterosaur. On a pterosaur, the wing hangs only on one finger, an oversized pinky. Scansoriopterygids were ornithodirons like pterosaurs, and their wings were more like bats in that two of their three fingers were in the membrane. So in a strange way, scansoriopterygids were very close or similar to birds, bats, and pterosaurs all at the same time, even though they were not any of those. Uh, they were their own separate branch from the same root as birds, though they didn't have the many adaptations for flight that pterosaurs and modern birds have. Importantly, the earliest birds didn't have them either. The subtle adaptations Minton admired in his seagull did not exist in the early birds, nor in most of the Mesozoic dinosaurs that he has confused with birds. Well, this is a good place to recognize who do we have to thank for these wonderful birds and I have no doubt it is our Lord that we can thank. You have no doubt because you're not allowed to doubt, not when you're paid to make believe. So you're not able to critically examine any of this objectively. Try to understand that every species of bird alive today, plus some notable extinct ones like the dodo, giant penguins, elephant bird, terror birds, and the terror torn and the toothy pelagornis, are all derived from one of only two sister lineages to survive the Cretaceous tertiary extinction. Know that they didn't die in your mythic flood, where God promised that Noah's Ark would save them. And not because God failed again, but because we know and can prove for certain that Noah's flood never happened. Not just that it couldn't happen, but that even if it could happen, we still know that it didn't happen. What did happen was an impact from space that slammed the door in the Mesozoic era 66 million 30,000 years ago, give or take. Every bird to survive beyond that point is in the ornith. But before that, there were a number of other bird lineages that were all wiped out. 
And we know them by representative genus in Antiornis, Hesperornis, Ichthyornis, Confuciusornis, all containing multiple species that were distinctly different from each other and also from any modern bird. So while you're thinking of, while you're thanking your God for the few birds we still have, which all diversified from two branches of one surviving supergroup, are you also going to thank him for all those other far more diverse bird groups that were wiped out entirely long before people existed? Paleontologists, archaeologists, and historians around the world and across time have independent histories that all match each other. The only thing that doesn't match is the math of the moron who gave you the idea that the universe is only 6,000 years old. I give you the benefit of the doubt because there isn't any. We know that Bishop Usher got all his calculations wrong, not just that one. Uh, the Bible doesn't want you to be confused on birds right away in Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. Uh, the scripture tells us how the birds came to be. This is on the fifth day of creation. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So when you look up in the sky, what you see is what the Bible calls a firmament. And the birds seem to fly, of course, right across the face of that. Let's not forget that every book of the Bible was written by people, not God. The reason that every scientific claim the Bible makes is absolutely embarrassingly wrong is that it was written by ignorant and bigoted superstitious savages who obviously had no idea what they were talking about. They thought the earth was a flat disk standing on pillars or columns like a map on a table. When they spoke of the firmament, they were talking about a giant crystal dome with windows in it that covered the disk-shaped map of the earth. This idea was repeated on every religion across Asia at that time. Some modern Christians with advanced education in science understand that when God said in the Bible to you know, let the earth bring forth this or that thing, then the earth brought them forth, which is a perfect way to explain evolution from a religious perspective. Rather than individually poofing every species out of nothing by magic, God devised a system of population mechanics called evolution, which is the only explanation for the data we actually see. And while no one has ever seen anything created, we know that evolution happens, and we know how it happens. There's so much that we can prove about it now that it's stupid to deny it anymore. It's not just increasingly willfully ignorant. It's become dishonest. You have no excuse. So uh, all of the flying birds, uh, presumably the non-flying birds as well, some birds fly in water when you think about it. It's just a different medium. The same muscles and bone specializations required essentially the same, to swim or fly in water as to fly in air. Genesis 1 goes on to say in verse 21, So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. So there are different kinds of birds. They're not all one kind. And in the Bible, that word kind comes from a Hebrew word, min. It basically means all creatures that are capable of interbreeding, producing offspring. That's why the Lord saw to it that at least one pair of every min, a male and a female, uh, got aboard the ark. So the biblical definition of kind matches the biological species concept, meaning that it's just a synonym of species. That's another problem for the Noah's Ark fable because there are some 10,000 some odd described species of birds. And you can't use the excuse that they evolved new species because you refuse to accept macroevolution, which is variation at or above the species level. That means that it includes speciation itself. And even if we account for the possibility of infertile hybrids between species and push the classification of kinds back to the genus level, here is a list of some 2,302 bird genera within 242 avian families, meaning you'd have at least 4,600 individual birds on Noah's Ark. And that's just the birds that are still around today. That doesn't include any of the fossil varieties, which is another problem for the Ark fable, because there were more genera in the fossil record than we still have left today. I've been to the Ark Park to see the facade you have erected there, where you pretend to account for dinosaurs and pterosaurs and everything else too. But I know that even with the modern electronic ventilation you've installed, you still couldn't accommodate every kind of bird on that boat, even if you didn't have any other sorts of animals on board. Can someone tell me what the Hebrew word for a sort means? Because the Bible says there's every kind of bird and all sorts of birds too, but what is a sort? And why are all sorts and kinds of birds not collectively called the bird kind? 
especially when there's a single kind for beasts and another one for cattle. What's the difference? Aren't they both? The Bible authors didn't know. That's why they had another kind for creeping things. So obviously they're not using the same definition you are. Because the mere fallible primitives who wrote the Bible classified things by what they do rather than what they are. That's why the Bible classed lobsters and whales both as fish when neither category is correct. That's why it says that bats are birds in one verse where they fly. And thus, the mere fallible primitives who wrote the Bible would have called pterosaurs birds too if they'd ever seen one, even though that's wrong too. So birds are day five creatures. I'd say dinosaurs are day six creatures because they're all terrestrial. Not that they can't wade in water once in a while. Uh, but uh, they're a day six bird, or a creature. So I, I really believe God's word is telling us birds are not dinosaurs. And I think scientifically we can show that too. You don't know how to show anything scientifically. And you don't have God's word either. All you have is a collection of man-made mythology. Uh, people trying to make up stories to, to explain what no one yet understood. That's why there's two different orders of creation, each contradicting the other, and both of them are wrong. No. Marine organisms came first, then plants moved onto the land, followed by terrestrial animals, and then we have pterosaurs and birds, which is the only explanation for why these are flying tetrapods. And what we now know is birds are dinosaurs. Say it with me. I'm a dinosaur. Well, I know you can say this. I'm a dinosaur. You didn't. I've been trying to teach him this for years. He'll never say it.